Hi, today I'd like to talk about the 8-bit buses in this processor design. Now, I apologize for the people who uh, who really just want to see me plug components into breadboard, but um, the benefit of having this conversation now is it does actually open up a, a whole lot of building. So at the moment, we've looked at the address registers and connecting those up to the system are two 16-bit buses, one for address data that goes to memory and one for transferring 16-bit data between those registers. The only 8-bit bus we have in the system is memory. Now, the only thing we've got connected to that, apart from some LEDs, is the first pipeline stage. And what that does is it uses the memory access to fetch instructions. And that dispatches instructions into the remainder of the pipeline. So what we need to do is start looking at the main 8-bit bus. Now, this bus is really and truly the heart of the communication within the processor. Everything goes through this to one degree or another. And the other buses, they're really just there to handle special case data and take the load off this bus. So we're not bottlenecked on our data transfer. So memory exists as an independent bus purely so that the fetch unit can pull data off there while the main bus is performing uh, data transfer operations relating to computation. So let's talk about what a bus actually is. Really and truly, it's, um, it's a bunch of connections. In the cases of the 8-bit buses, it's basically eight wires on the breadboard or on a PCB eventually. And there's a set of rules for a bus about what's going to be reading from it and what's going to be asserting a value onto the bus. So we need some logic in there to stop more than one thing trying to assert a value at the same time, or we run into uh, electrical problems. On the, the main 8-bit bus, what we're going to have is some general purpose registers. Now these are going to be latch-based and you know, they store numbers. One of the first things you look at when you're looking at a new processor architecture to program it is what registers do I have? And then you look at what operations you can perform on them. And that's your, your fundamental building blocks of, uh, of software. What we will need to do is we're going to need to access memory and load values into registers. The processor that I'm building is, um, is going to have two ways of doing that. The most important one is the device I'm calling the memory bridge. Now on the main 8-bit bus, what you have is a series of devices that are going to be accessed by index and the uh, control unit is going to say, right, device X you're asserting to the bus and device Y you're going to read a value off the bus. So the memory bridge is very simply, it's a bridge between the memory data bus and the main 8-bit bus. When we come along and write to the memory bridge device, what we're doing is we're saying we want this 8 bits of data and we want to put it on the memory bus. So we'll have a bunch of other control lines that we've had to uh, set up in order to make memory available for writing so we're not already asserting a value onto the bus. But really and truly, from the perspective of the 8-bit bus, the memory bridge is going to look an awful lot like a register. When we want to read a byte from memory, we tell the memory bridge to assert to the bus, and that effectively provides a connection between the memory bus and the 8-bit bus. A, a write to the memory bridge will, will reverse that. One other connection between these two buses that I've talked about before is the constant register. Now you can see here that the same as the memory bridge, the constant register has a connection to both the memory data bus and the main 8-bit bus. But in the case of the constant register, it's, um, it's going to be one way on both of these buses. It will read from the memory data bus and it's only capable of asserting its value to the main 8-bit bus. Now the constant register is, it's, it's worth mentioning independently, but it really only exists to solve a problem that is created by the, the structure of the pipeline. And that is, we don't want to be controlling wherever possible the same piece of the processor from multiple stages in the pipeline in order to avoid the contention issues. So because of a lot of the other cases where we want to control the main 8-bit bus all come in this pipeline step two. That means that we'd really like to do all of them from here unless we've got a, a specific reason not to. The fetching of instructions happens in pipeline stage zero and we've got a whole pipeline stage in between. What the constant register does 
is it's basically a storage location for constant data. So pipeline stage one, if, if it decodes instruction and realizes there's constant data following that instruction, it instructs the constant register to load that. It takes care of um, ensuring that the fetch unit isn't uh, interpreting that byte as, as an instruction. That is then data that sat there ready to be asserted to the bus at a, a later point in this pipeline stage here. We'll also have a number of special purpose registers. General purpose registers, GPRs, are values that we're, we're working on that generally have quite a, a wide variety of, of purpose to them. If you're familiar with assembly language program, you, you're, these, these are the registers that you're doing most of your data operations in. The constant register is really a special purpose register, but um, it's got its independent connection to the memory data bus. So we've connected up separately here. Special purpose registers would include things like the transfer register that we've discussed before. Now the transfer register, it doesn't have as wide a set of connections as the GPRs are going to have, but it does provide a connection bridge between the 16-bit registers and the 8-bit registers. So we'll be building that in the not too distant future and that's going to uh, enable us to construct 16-bit addresses from 8-bit operations. Those are the only special purpose registers I'm expecting at the moment. I've had a few ideas for others but um, I'm very much trying to to keep the flow of the processor um, simple at the moment. It's more than complicated enough as it is. We'll also have some I.O. port. In the processor design I'm working on, the I.O. ports, once again, they're attached to the bus very much like a, a register. We can read or write an 8-bit quantity from them, and they're basically going to be whatever spare addresses we have on the 8-bit bus. I'm going to use those to attach some peripherals. I don't know exactly what those peripherals are yet. I've got a few ideas, but they're, um, they're going to be a connection to the outside world because it would be nice to, to make this processor you know, do some interesting things. The last primary thing that's going to be on the 8-bit bus will be the ALU, Arithmetic and Logic Unit. Now, there's actually a lot of different ways that you can make an ALU communicate with the rest of the processor, but the ALU here is going to be writing its result to the bus when it's requested. Now, if you see here, I've, um, I've got two different pipeline steps that are associated with ALU operations. We've got pipeline step one is marked for ALU di dispatch. And what that means is if, say, I've got an instruction that is going to add two registers together, in pipeline stage one, the instruction will be decoded and whatever it needs to do to start that operation happening will uh, be kicked off. But then in pipeline stage two is when that result will be finished and it will be available on the ALU. So just like everything else, the 8-bit bus control, we simply tell the ALU, write your register contents onto the bus, and then we'll be telling a GPR or an SPR or perhaps memory or an I.O. port, you're reading that data off and, and consuming the result of that operation. Now there's a complexity there because we don't have um, any connection to or any control over the, the main 8-bit bus from pipeline stage 1 where the ALU is going to dispatch operations. So what there will also be is a set of connections which I'm going to discuss in depth more when we move on to talk about the ALU and how that's going to work. But there will be some direct connectivity between the ALU and the general purpose registers. And that gives us a, an extra path of data. So if I want to add to the contents of two registers together, then those can be read directly from the, the GPRs by the ALU and then the result provided. And that's uh, that's going to let us improve the throughput of the, the processor to a, a much higher level than if we were having to transfer the inputs to the ALU across the 8-bit bus as well. Okay, so we're going to have these uh, bus connections between the devices. I've not put the 16-bit side of things onto this chart, but this is the main flow of data between devices on the 8-bit side of the processor. 
there will be a whole set of control lines that are, are connecting things uh, around here. So pipeline stage two will have a set of control lines that are indirectly wired to everything to allow it to instruct things to assert to the bus or read from it. And both pipeline stage one and two will have a lot of connections to the various devices here. And of course, all the pipeline stages have um, connections to, to various elements across the processor. Okay, so in the next video, I'll be building the controller for the 8-bit bus, and this will draw a lot on the work I did in part 5 with the 74LS138 demultiplexer chip, and that's going to give us the capability of addressing a large number of devices on the bus from a small number of control lines coming out of pipeline stage 2. Then I'll be moving on and building some registers. Then, this gets pretty exciting actually, then we'll, uh, we'll go back to the pipeline and we'll see if we can get the system to actually execute some basic instructions. Anyway, for now, thanks for watching. Goodbye.